Good, good morning. Good morning, Revolution. Uh, good Joe morning. is unable to join us this morning, but uh, Anita's here and Rosanna and Michael. Good morning, comrades. Good, good morning, morning. Revolution. Revolution. Uh, we got a um, few things to talk about today. Local elections that just happened. Very, uh, very mixed bag. Um, some victories, some losses. Uh, the COP26 summit and um, a question from a reader about socialism in the US uh, versus in other countries. Um, so Anita, uh, can you start us off? Local elections, what happened in your area? Sure, uh, thanks Scott. Yeah, I was really concerned about the school boards. We have, I'm in the Columbus suburbs right now. Columbus City was fine, no, no crazy people running for school board from Columbus, but, um, but in the suburbs, a couple, a couple people did win. Um, and there, there, uh, there was a, there's a pack that was formed, 1776 pack, uh, that that supported um, 58 candidates uh, for school boards in, and and won three quarters of them, including these two in Hilliard, Ohio. So um, they were formed. Really, a lot of people are saying um, CRT. Well, CRT isn't really taught in in, in grades K 12, but um, but that what they're going after is the 1619 project, uh, which the New York Times put together and was very successful and also was introduced in the schools. That's what's really the, the target of these groups. They don't want, um, they don't want uh, us uh, teachers teaching about the, uh, the history of the United States in terms of uh, its, um, uh, in terms of race relations and, and oppression of uh, racial groups. So um, it will be interesting to see. They had um, a, a, a big victory of these uh, right-wing school board uh, folks in Pennsylvania and Colorado, but as, as well as about six other states. Um, and they're going to target uh, South Carolina and, and Florida next. So I think we're gonna see more from this group. And it looked, of course, that goes right into the Virginia case because he also uh, um, focused, the uh, Republican candidate focused a lot on CRT. But um, at, luckily in my area, we defeated uh, one of those people. And we had good elections, local elections in other parts of Ohio, including mayors, progressive mayors in, in Cleveland and, um, and Cincinnati. So it's a mixed bag, as you said. I'm, I'm right here on the border of, of Pennsylvania and, and New York. And on the Pennsylvania side, there was another uh, situation with, with school boards like you were describing. In fact, the school district I grew up in, um, there were a number of write-in candidates uh, backed by uh, the, the, the sort of head of the group is somebody who's directly connected to Steve Bannon, um, has hosted Steve Bannon at his, uh, his shooting range or whatever, um, extremely, you know, extremely conservative fascist. Uh, and, um, absolutely opposed to, to masks, to vaccines. Um, and I went to a town hall and I pushed him a little bit on some of this stuff, including critical race theory. Um, and his, his answer was, well, uh, I don't think we should, we should erase American history, even the bad parts, but, but, but we, shouldn't, we shouldn't make it seem like one race has more responsibility for it than another. So you, you're planning to teach slavery, but not imply that there was a racial component to it. No, it's, it's, it's craziness. And it's obviously, um, you know, it, it's just, it's the most blatant kind of white supremacy. And it's, what was interesting to me was the way it was packaged. And it was all packaged in, I wanna give you the parents a voice. I wanna give you, I wanna, I want you to have a voice. I want you to feel free to come to the school board. And um, so, it's interesting that this democratic posturing, small d democratic posturing is, it is meaningful to people, it does work. Uh, but um, Michael, you wanted to, you were following the race of India Walton in Buffalo, right? Oh yes, yes. Had a lot of uh, close friends and contacts go up there and uh, uh, try to help her get elected. They worked with people in her community and her constituency. Um, because she did, she won the, the, the democratically elected, you know, nomination um, over the summer. And uh, Byron Brown, the incumbent uh, uh, mayor, ran a very successful writing campaign against her. 
And I don't know, I think we could probably count on our fingers the amount of write-in campaigns that have won like that. And it was very sad that the Democratic establishment, they kind of covered their their butt, if you know what I mean, because the two uh, Democratic senators, Chuck Schumer uh, and, and so forth, they uh, endorsed India Walton, but then the Democratic establishment locally uh, ran against her and risked a possible even Republican victory. So that was very unfortunate to see in the city of Buffalo, you know, against an African-American uh, self-described socialist. Um, and they were up the street, they kind of do it at the polling place, but the Democratic establishment pro Byron Brown, you know, uh, uh, campaign team were up the street handing out stamps, because as you know, if you're doing a writing campaign, you have to write it in exactly as it's spelled, Byron Brown, you know, if you spell it wrong, you put an I instead of a Y, you know, you, they throw it in the garbage, and it doesn't count, and so they were handing out stamps. And so it was very unfortunate to see, however, we did get some um, really good uh, results here in the city, in New York City. Uh, we have a self-described socialist um, who won in Harlem, uh, Kristen Jordan, Richardson Jordan, uh, who's also a member of the LGBTQ community. We had Car uh, Carmen de la Rosa uh, win uh, the a city council seat like Kristen Jordan uh, for the area of Washington Heights, also a very progressive figure. And so it wasn't, you know, totally depressing, you know, and I was happy to see in the uh, people's world, they reported in the small town of Sequim, Washington, uh, you know, they defeated a QAnon right wing conspiracy theorist mayor. And so, you know, it was a mixed result. There was Virginia and then the too close for comfort result in uh, New Jersey. And then, of course, the defeat of India Walton. But I think overall, I think uh, the, our working class really turned out to kind of dig in and, and uh, defend the, the small D Democratic gains that were won in the last uh, election a year ago. And I, I should say that the the all all uh, all the crazy write-ins in my school district were um, were defeated, which was which was good. Um, Rosanna, what did it look like in California? Well, we didn't have any uh, elections here in California. Okay, we had just had that special one. But I think what's important to note in these elections is the turnout of people. You know, people when people realize that they do have a voice by voting, because we have the numbers to, to elect much more progressive candidates, much more uh, you know, people that represent our working class, but people don't turn out to vote. And we have to really understand the need to turn out to vote. Uh, and when we do, like in Sequim, which is, it, I've been to Sequim, it's a very small rural town. And people turned out to vote because there was work in, involved in getting out the vote and things like that. Uh, and they turned out to vote and they defeated these QAnons who were outright threatening uh, you know, physical violence and things like that. So I think um, the important lesson for all of us here is we got to turn out to vote. We can't just complain or we just can't turn our backs. We have to turn, we have to uh, go out and vote. If we go out and vote, we have the numbers. Re uh, Reverend Barber proved uh, the Poor People's Campaign came out with a report that showed that if poor people actually went out to vote, we had the numbers to make the difference. And I think uh, that's, that's a, a really important uh, point to keep in mind. Even if you don't want to vote or if you're disillusioned or whatever, go out and vote anyway. It really does make a difference. Yeah, I think that's an excellent that's an excellent point. And there's, there's a lot of people I know in my area that um, didn't. Uh, I think there, there's a certain kind of um, confidence that you know the system's basically going to go on as it always has. Um, but when they saw that there were these these crazies, people did turn out. Um, so, in any case, while the, while the people in the many people in the U.S. were going to polls for their school boards and, and city councils and stuff, the uh, great and powerful of the world were gathered at the COP26 climate summit, um, trying to, uh, yet again, to prevent disaster. Um, do you think it's gonna be a meaningful, uh, the result's gonna be meaningful, Rosanna, or um, just more talk? It's hard to say, um, you know, it's, they're talking, and they're recognizing that you know climate change is here; it's real. There's no denying that. So that's that's a good positive step. Whether it's too late or not, I don't know. I just I think uh, 
I, th I think the idea of it being too late, um, we sort of need to uh, understand it by, you know, we, it means we have some issues and some challenges, but I don't think, uh, especially for our younger audience, it's not doomsday. I don't, and, and many people translate it as a doomsday thing. And I don't, I don't think that we should do that. Uh, but we do need to continue to push for it and pressure our legislators. And once again, this is why it is important to go out and vote, to show your voice, to go out and not just in the streets, but you know, call your members of Congress and senators and get involved in those kinds of ways that show that you know they work for us, you know, and so we're not we're not at their mercy. So we but we need to voice our our, our thinking in the various ways that we have. And our desires for them to to do what they the right thing, so I I think you know we'll see we'll see what happens. Uh, there was some very compelling um, uh, speeches by some of the world leaders in in the smaller islands, how you know the devastation has affected them, and yet they're not the cause of it. Uh, so there's some some uh, there were some really important uh, presentations, but what the results are. I'm, I don't know that I can be sure of that. Anita? Uh, did, uh, did you have something? I thought you had your... Yes. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Scott. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with Rosanna. It's um, there, and I, I think um, the, the best parts of what I've seen from the uh, conference so far is the young people and the activism and the urgency on their part and Greta Thunberg's famous um, speech, which is quoted all over the place with her saying, blah, 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 no more blah, blah, blah. It's really, um, really calling out uh, the leaders to, of, of these delegations to get down to business. So I think they won't let up. They can't let up because it's going to be their, um, their, their adulthood that they're going to be grappling with the consequences of, of global climate. Uh, change. So I think um, I think it's just heartening to see the young people really um, call out bullshit uh, when they see it. And I understand that they have a day, I think tomorrow or today, of um, really focusing on what young activists have to say. So that'll be interesting to, to see. And by the way, there's a lot in the media about how, oh, China isn't there or didn't send it. You know, no, that's not true. China sent a high level de delegation. Uh, to this conference, as uh, did Russia. I know Putin is not there, but who cares, you know, and he's, uh, I know Russia sent a delegation too, as, you know, of course, these, these uh, nations sent their, uh, they have, they have people dedicated to um, negotiating, uh, dedicated to the blah, blah, blah. So if I might say that, but um, yeah, I think they were there and represented just as well. Thanks. Okay. There did seem to be some uh, progress. Um, I read there, there was a, on Wednesday night, an agreement uh, by 20 or 22 countries, including the US, to end public financing of uh, fossil fuel extraction. Um, and the, the projection from that is uh, that we could limit uh, the rise in temperature to 1.8 degrees uh, by the year 2100, um, which is still not consistent with, you know, really a habitable planet, but is better than the 2.7 that, that it would be otherwise if things just continued. Um, that said, public financing is not the problem. Um, a, a, an, a, an important report just came out last week uh, from a group called the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, which monitors private equity uh, firms, that is firms that by companies and take over their management to turn a profit. Um, and those firms, as the, as the big publicly traded companies like Shell and, and Exxon and Chevron pull back from fossil fuels because they realize they're not profitable anymore, the, the regulatory risks are too much, whatever, um, private equity has actually poured into that gap uh, to fund new projects, to keep old projects going, um, and it's to me incredibly worrisome because the assets these private equity firms are buying are usually the oldest, dirtiest, you know, most polluting things. And 
that they're doing this, suggesting that they have a plan um, financially and politically to make these things profitable, which means they are pouring everything they have into combating climate change, even as, you know, on the surface, they, they, they make their, um, you know, ridiculous gestures. There, there was one, uh, one of them uh, promised to, um, what was it? Every time they acquire a fossil fuel asset, they will attempt to reduce its uh, emissions by 15% in the first three years. Um, but they, you don't, you can't, you're not actually allowed to see data on each fossil fuel asset, only the aggregate of all their holdings. So it's, a, I mean, it's obvious who the enemy is in, in, in this fight. Uh, Michael, have you seen, um, in terms of climate activism among youth in the United States, um, what's the picture? You know, um, the Sunrise Movement is really uh, turning out um, here at NYU in the city uh, to divest funds um, away for and, and holding uh, Biden accountable, you know, for, for all these promises that he's making. And since a lot of them, what's really impressive with the youth of this generation, uh, they tend to be college students or former college, you know, uh, grad graduates. And they're holding him accountable on two accounts, one for climate change. Uh, and they, they say, you know, real something that's uh, meaningful uh, climate resolutions, you know, at, the, at this meeting in Glasgow. But also they're combining that with um, uh, anti-war propositions. You know, there was this weird, I don't know if it was a joke or what, but out of the Glasgow meeting, there were some memes going around on the internet uh, about how we don't need to fear Star Wars anymore. We should be fearing sea wars. <laughs> and it kind of goes into what's been, what's been happening with this recent military alliance um, between Australia, the UK, and the United States with the nuclear submarines. So it's really, you know, and, and so these young people, even though they're not quote unquote Marxist, they're able to connect the, the struggle for student debt, the struggle for peace, uh, anti-imperialism really, you know, with that whole, uh, the, the nuclear submarine scandal, and then the struggle to save the planet. And so the fact that they're able to do this just because of what the conditions are, is really impressive. And so keep your eye on the Sunrise Movement, on other uh, climate activists, um, these uh, the, the student debt um, uh, collectives that are being set up, because that's, I mean, that's the future of our movement right there. It's really exciting to see. And uh, Rosanna, I, I've noticed a lot in the news, um, just people hammering on the fact that China is, you know, on track to become the world's biggest polluter. China is building all these coal plants. China, um, so what, what's the role of sort of imperialism? It, we call it green imperialism or something, this attempt to offshore the burden of, of fighting climate change onto you know, nations that are, are struggling to climb out of um, the imperialist oppression or? Well, I, I think it's, you know, it's all propaganda. They're trying to, you know, yes, China, China is a polluter, but they're also working to eliminate all of this. You know, let's not forget the, the things that they're doing to, to eliminate that they're working hard, they're dedicated to. President Xi is, the, is, a, is an environmentalist from the get-go. So he's, he's working towards, it's not an easy thing because they're also you know, trying to establish their country and, and set up things. So it's, it's kind of, um, uh, you, you have to kind of, Go with what you've got and how to figure it out. But I think that that um, you know, I, I read some time ago that there are are uh, what is the they're, they're learning to recycle some of these things so that they can reuse it for energy as opposed to you know using coal and things like that. And um, I don't quite remember what that process looked like, but you know they're 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 work they're working they. They're showing by their actions that they're trying to work on it. You know, here in the United States, you know, it's just blah blah blah, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know, so I think that you know we have to be mindful and look deeper when we hear some of these things. They may be true, they may not be true, but let's not just take them on their surface. Let's look in deeper. Absolutely, blah blah blah. While well, we burned gas and oil and and coal wildly to you know fuel our 
arms race and industrialization and imperialist takeovers. Um, so that's actually a good point to pivot to our, um, our mailbag question. We have a question from a reader um, asking, what will socialism in the US be like? Will it be like uh, socialism in the DPRK uh, or in China? Um, what are your thoughts, Anita? Uh, well, Scott, I think that's a, 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 Michael was saying earlier, it's a perennial question. Um, because I think um, when our founder, the founders of the, uh, historical materialism were writing, they weren't making a blueprint for socialism will look exactly like this or exactly like that. And I think um, as we've seen in China, the, the, the phrase uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, each, um, each place where uh, socialism can take root will have its own cultural baggage and its own particular history. Um, that it is working uh, through. So I think it will be, uh, socialism will be uh, different in all of those places. I mean, there will th be things uniting all of them that, uh, you know, the working class will be the class, uh, the ruling class of that, um, of uh, socialist society. Um, but, but how that um, manifests itself in different uh, cultural areas with very different histories will, will look different. So, um, I think the answer is no, it won't, but and the, it will be you know, similar. capitalism the same. Does, does capitalism in the US look the same as capitalism in the European Union or in Turkey? Mexico. Or, or in Mexico, exactly. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, I was thinking uh, when I was younger living in Dominican Republic and I would come back here and I would be so, you know how they used to have the milkmen here in like the 50s, but you would drink your milk and then you put it out and they'd replace it. They have Coca-Cola men in Dominican Republic. You always have Coca-Cola in your house. Good for, you know, avoiding diabetes in the Dominican Republic. But that's just, you know, it's different. And uh, I remember when someone asked me, you know, we were out there tabling, people say, well, if socialism's so great, why do so many people come from Cuba? And my answer was, why do so many people come from Mexico? That's a capital this country. So, you know, no system is perfect. I know the Cubans and the Chinese and, and the DPRK, they would be enraged if they would hear us over here in the United States saying that their systems were perfect. They would say, no, 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 we have lots of problems. But I think Anita hit the, the nail on the head there because she said, you know, China has socialism with uh, uh, Chinese characteristics and the DPRK has Juche, you know, self-reliance, which is specialized to the, their context. And we have Bill of Rights socialism. And I remember watching an old video from Gus Hall uh, when he was asked about what would socialism look like. He was, this, he was asked in the 80s. He said, Americans will always want a Bill of Rights. Under socialism, they will expect a Bill of Rights. And it's interesting because when we're out there, the, the YCL, Young Communist League, engaging with the public, we're often asked, oh, you communists, you know, are you going to take away my right to own a gun? Are you going to take away my freedom of speech? And our answer is no, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to implement a bill of rights, the, the rights that you think you have under capitalism to truly exist, we're gonna expand those rights under socialism. And so I think that's important that, you know, we have our own um, traditions, our own history. And as you said, you know, it, we, socialism wouldn't look the same here, but capitalism also doesn't look the same here, so. And, and what socialism look like, look, will look like is in some part determined by the composition of the struggle to create it. Um, so, uh, the environmental movement will right now be a major part of the push toward you know, um, a more rational planned economy for people's rights and all of that. So that will be reflected in the shape of socialism as well, I think. Um, Rosanna, uh, what do you think are the, some of the specific characteristics that will be uh, elevated and brought forth in, in socialism in the United States? Well, my thing is, you know, we end the homelessness, we end the hunger. Those are the things that I, I'm fighting for. Ending, you know, ending the, the abuse that children have to live under because they don't have uh, enough food, they don't have a good education. They have uh, parents who have to work two or three jobs, so they're not able to have that that bonding time with their parents. Um, you know, just, <clears throat> just yesterday, there was a homeless man who was killed or died uh, in downtown Los Angeles. They found him dead. There was another one that I drove by 
that was laying on the street that also looked like he had passed. That's what I want to end. And that's what socialism will end because it'll end this idea of putting people uh, after the prophets, the prophets go first, it'll end that. And when we put people before prophets, then people's needs will be met. And you know, there's a lot of people with mental health issues that need, that need help. I think, you know, there's just a lot that will, all the suffering, I think we would work very hard to end first and foremost. So that's what I foresee. Yeah, all of the, this, this idea that, you know, of course people are going to starve to death. Of course people are gonna die. Uh, this idea that, that that level of suffering and, and dehumanization is somehow acceptable or necessary. That idea is baked into capitalism which is why we have to get rid of it, right? In Cuba, there's a lot of things that Cuba doesn't have um, because of the blockade, because of the struggle to build socialism, but people don't starve to death in Cuba. People don't lack housing in Cuba. They don't lack medical care because the underlying thought is whatever amount we have is enough to go around. Even if it means, you know, uh, we might not be able to build, um, you know, uh, fancy new housing. We might not be able to, um, you know, um, whatever, uh, have a, a lot of new cars on the streets. 16 um, different brands of ketchup at the store. 16 different really? brands of ketchup and, and, you know, 850 TV channels. But nobody goes to bed without having food. Even at the worst moments of the special period, everyone, um, everyone ate. Uh, and that's a huge deal. Um, so I, I want to say another thing. Oh, yeah, they yeah. Don't, another thing they don't have in in Cuba is is uh, consumer goods that are ridiculous, like the brands of ketchup. But I I always go back to a New York Times um, example that I saw in the New York Times magazine one time, and it had tote bags that you could buy, and there was a tote bag for twenty five hundred dollars. And it's just, I don't want to live in a society where somebody's spending $2,500 on a tote bag. And, and it's advertised in the newspaper. So there's probably more than one person out there who uh, will buy this tote bag. And to me, that's like the epitome of, of waste, the waste of capital capitalism that, that people, as Rosanna said, are dying on the street. And yet someone else is walking around with a $2,500 tote bag. That's my, the end of my uh, rant. Thanks. And I, I think I think probably a, a, a good end for the show, um, getting rid of that that obscene inequality and, and inhumanity of capitalism. Um, that's why we say good morning revolution and we'll keep saying it and we hope it's here soon. Uh, Michael, any uh, any upcoming events, uh, classes, anything like that? Well, on Sunday, November 14th at 11 a.m., usually our Sunday webinars are a little bit uh, later in the evening, around 7 or 8, but this is at 11 a.m. We're having a guest, Dr. Prabhat Potnik from uh, the Communist Party of India Marxist, um, and he will be speaking to us about uh, neo-fascism and neoliberalism, why neoliberalism needs fascists and, and vice versa, and how the fascist danger exists within the framework of neoliberalism. So it'll be very exciting. Uh, to see November 14th, Sunday at 11 a.m. So we'll see you there. All right. Thank you, comrades. Um, have a good weekend and uh, stay in the fight. Good morning, revolution. Good morning, revolution. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.